So good afternoon. Welcome to the last one in the series of Action in Acts in this summer of our Bible talks. This, uh, this afternoon we have Reverend Dr. Graham Adams, who Liz will introduce in a second. Before we do so, a prayer before we begin. Lord, help us to live with love for others, live with compassion for others, live without bitterness towards others, and live without conflict with others. We pray that we may strive to always have a clear conscience. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So Liz, over to you. Thanks. So it's my uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce Graham, who's a theological educator who I'm working with these days, uh, specializes in missiology and teaches for the Northern College, which is part of the Luther King Center in Manchester. And Graham's written various books, including Scripture and Resistance and others, but this one is absolutely brilliant. I can't re recommend it highly enough. In fact, it's so good that people keep nicking my copy because so <laughs> I'm waxing lyrical about it. So uh, I look forward to what you're going to say to us, Graham. Thanks. Thanks very much, Liz. I'll just uh, hopefully get the technology to behave. Um, oh, I've not appeared yet, have I? You're not there yet. No. Let me try. Oh. Thanks for the big build up and now uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing's quite happening. Um okay, I might be I won't worry about the cameo. Um can you? Okay, so yes. Yeah. Oh everyone okay. Can you see the slides? Yeah, thanks. So thanks very much for the welcome. It's really good to be with you. And I was uh, pleased to be able to dip into one or two of the others, um, the videos afterwards to see what is going on. It looks like you've been having a, a great um, journey along with the, the apostles through ACTS. So um, yeah, as Liz says, I've recently written a book, which I'll um, refer to a little bit um, in a while. But uh, today I've been given the, the subject of the a Church of Joy using the Acts of the Apostles uh, to explore this theme. So let's see where it leads us. Um, the first thing to say is that I am a fairly positive person, I think mostly, um, quite like a joke and so on, but I still instinctively have a bit of a, um, I instinctively feel a slightly awkward with the phrase, a church of joy. Um, we are going to explore it, but I, I think there can be a bit of a pressure sometimes for church to be a joyful space. Uh, and that's not wholly positive if that's the, the only thing we seek to be, because uh, it, it means that we would be denying aspects of reality if we all try to be happy uh, in church. So it's important for us not to deny reality. Um, it even has the potential to be spiritually abuse, abusive, I think, if we were to put pressure on people to deny their pain, to shut themselves off from their pain. And so we ought not to be a space or a community of people which does that. We should allow people's honest uh, naming and, uh, and owning of the pain and struggles of life. Um, if we were only a church of joy, we would also be editing so much out about scripture and our understanding uh, and faith in God, who is more than simply a God who gives joy. God is there in the midst of the pain with us and is angry in the face of suffering and injustice too. Uh, so yes, joy, 
let's seek to be joyful people, but also um, people of lament and so much more, I think. The thing is, joy is always perhaps a little bit double-edged. Um, as I say, I don't think it should be about editing our faith. Our faith has so many different angles and sides to it, or an editing of reality. Reality is a struggle for so many people, uh, and we need to integrate joy with the other parts of the whole. But even joy itself has different edges to it. We can be joyful because of things, and that's completely appropriate, isn't it, to be joyful because of good things happening in our lives or in the world. Uh, but sometimes we also try to be um, or are encouraged to be joyful despite things, and that's perhaps a little bit more problematic to be so hard things happen we should be joyful despite them we may manage that sometimes but it's if we were put under pressure to do that that might be problematic but there might be something useful in being joyful in the face of things because certainly if we think about how humor is used it certainly is used to diffuse situations but also to laugh in the face of um a, a situation that feels overbearing can have a certain power of its own. It has a defiant quality. So I'm quite drawn to the idea of a church of joy that isn't simply about happiness and certainly isn't about denying the pain and struggles of life, but might sometimes be about having a defiant quality in the face of the struggles that the world throws at us. Um, <clears throat> already you'll be get a sense that I, I come with certain interests in this. Um, I have an angle and it's good to acknowledge my angle uh, as we all come to questions uh, with, with a certain sort of history. Um, and so yeah, this is this my book, Holy Anarchy, um, is I suppose a thing that I'm very much living with, not only since having written it for over a few months, but then since with various speaking engagements. So it's a thing that I keep coming back to and keep seeing things through the lens of it. Um, and so what is holy anarchy? And essentially it is another way of thinking of the kingdom of God, the realm of God, the place, the space where God's will is done. Um, but that might seem strange to call it holy anarchy. People can be a bit um, befuddled by that. Um, but if we think of the kingdom of God as a realm, which is about the turning upside down of the ways of the world, the disrupting of business, of business as usual, then holy anarchy is a place where the last are first, where the hungry are fed, those on thrones are humbled. It's a place where the world is turned upside down and inside out. So it does have an anarchic quality to it. And I think very much through scripture, we see that where God does new things to turn things on their head, there is a certain joy to it. There's a joyfulness and a delightfulness in disrupting the the ways that we take for granted, the things that just seem to be inevitable, but actually God brings a, um, a newness and a wit and a potential to, to change them. So God's kingdom uh, is disruptive. It turns things upside down. It has a certain anarchic quality to it. So I confess I'm looking for anarchic joy. I don't know if you can spot it anywhere in this mountain range. You might have to keep looking. It's not easy to spot. And that is perhaps part of this quality. It's not always easy to spot. It's not always in the right places or even amongst the right people. It takes us by surprise. There's something about the kingdom of God in the parables that Jesus told that were about unexpectedness and how it is often hidden like yeast in the dough. Uh, it's mixed in with all sorts of other stuff going on. But still, this vision of holy anarchy, this vision of the alternative kingdom of God, which turns things upside down, uh, it can be, and it ought to be, the basis of joy, to delight in the disruptiveness which God brings to a world that can become stale and fixed and um, just goes with the flow of its own taken for grantedness. So we look for joy where things are turned upside down. We look for joy when awkward questions are asked about the ways of the world. We look for joy where the spirit sets free, where the spirit breaches boundaries that seem to be 
um, insurmountable. We look for joy where the spirit raises up those who have been made low and even humbles those who take their place for granted. We look for anarchic joy. But I think what we find, as I was beginning to say earlier, is that joy is never in a vacuum. And we certainly find this when we encounter the term and the idea and the experience of joy in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it does somehow take us by surprise because it's never quite on its own. Other things are happening where there is joy. And OK, so I'm looking for joy that is a bit complicated. I'm looking for joy that is a bit awkward. And funnily enough, that does seem to be what I find. <laughs> Um, and I don't think it's just because I'm looking for it. it I, I was actually quite surprised as I looked through the different stories of joy in the book, how it did have a sort of double edged nature to it. It did come along with other things. It wasn't about ignoring reality, but it was very much about living in the midst of things that were happening. So let's look at the stories where joy springs out. Here's an overview of them, which Liz very helpfully uh, drew my attention to. Um, so Joy in chapter five, uh, there is a rejoicing that the apostles were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name of Jesus. Fascinating in itself, rejoicing that you're considered worthy to suffer dishonor. So Joy going together with dishonor um joy that is very much in response to healing in chapter eight uh we'll come to that a little bit more but that obviously makes sense joy being joyful in the in the light of something positive the story of the eunuch he went on his way rejoicing and again there's uh interesting dynamics in that story which i'll mention in a moment uh the people saw the grace of god and rejoiced so again a good thing but a good thing with a double edge to it. Chapter 13, they shook off the, their feet in protest and went on their way with joy. So joy going together with protest. Chapter 14, God gives joy. So why are the people doing worthless things like sacrifices? So interesting there that joyfulness is set in tension uh, with doing worthless things. Great joy was brought to the believers in the light of an argument that had been happening amongst the community of disciples. So an argument had been raging, they resolved it, and there was joy. So joy, again, is not separate from the struggles that we must face. Chapter 15, again, rejoicing that grace took primacy over a rules-based approach to religion. And in chapter 16, a whole household rejoiced after baptism, and they responded to this by offering hospitality. I'm not going to look at all of these in equal detail, but here's how I'm sort of structuring the three, the three different kinds of joy that I'm identifying here. Oops. The first is to do with protest and suffering. A second set of stories is to do with inclusion. And the third set of stories are to do with how the community must reflect on its own identity and purpose. In each of these things, we see joy, but in each case, with a certain sort of edge to it. I hope this is making some sense so far, but feel free when we come together at the end to pick up on any questions. <clears throat> so the first way that I identify joy as not being in a vacuum is in context of protest. Um, Paul and Barnabas have been driven out of somewhere. They've been trying to offer the gospel of grace, the gospel of new life, the gospel of possibility and promise and hope. The gospel of love and it has been met with resistance uh, so it's a context of persecution too 
they, they are thrown out. And in response, they dust off their feet in protest, as I say, and then they go on their way rejoicing. It's a powerful image, I think, to shake off the dust off our feet. It's a symbolic act. It's a sort of gesture. Um, and it's very much the sort of thing that you might encounter in a carnival of protest in situations like um, where uh, climate um, protesters have gathered. There's often a carnival atmosphere in the protest. It's not all um, angry or serious. There's also a face painting for children. There's a whole mix of things that happens in these protests. So protest does not just um, reflect anger and frustration at the ways of the world. And protest also comes with a sense of joy that things can be different. It's a joyfulness that the way things are right now is not the end of the story. It's like looking for the alternative that's on the horizon and joyfully walking towards it, dancing towards it, dusting off our feet behind the world we're leaving towards the world that waits for us. Protest and joy can go together with symbolic gestures reminding us that the ways of the world, they do, do not need to be the end of the story. There are alternatives, though we're told so often that there are none. <clears throat> so I wonder, we might think, for instance, what are the things in our world which give us moments of joy where oppression ends, where we come through a tunnel, where things that we have been told are inevitably just going to stay the same, where they actually crumble? What are the things where we have cause, not only to shake off our dust, off our sandals, because they seem to be prevailing, but because actually they will turn to dust one day, empires will fall, there will be a new horizon of justice and compassion. What moments can we think of, whether through history or even now, where we might, as a gesture of protest, shake off the dust of our feet and go on rejoicing? And what are the things, even now, that we hope that may be the case? The second dimension of joy not being in a vacuum are in contexts of exclusion and inclusion. In Acts 8, as I said, there were several healings, even causing a whole city to rejoice. Uh, and healing is always not simply a, a physical act affecting the individual, but is always about relationships too, so that people are restored through healing to community with one another. And so to, and particularly in a context where um, to be um burdened and struggling with a certain sort of infirmity of one kind or another meant that you were regarded as with some suspicion regarded as unclean regarded as being worthy of being pushed to the edges then healing becomes an act of reclaiming someone's dignity and humanity and affirming that they have a place in the story so to heal is not just a, a physical thing but is also a, a social thing it is to enable inclusion and so the whole city rejoiced the whole city so it's it's beautiful the way that the impact doesn't just affect the individual but it reverberates through the whole community and then the story of the eunuch as well so the eunuch um someone in a sense between genders someone who was um regarded as being on the edge even though he had a sort of official role uh, in Ethiopia, he was still someone regarded with suspicion by religious and political structures. Uh, and he is welcomed into the story, baptized, and goes on his way rejoicing. So, again, this act of inclusion, this affirming and dignifying of someone who others held at arm's length at best, uh, it is a, a reflection of how joy goes very much with the movement to include. Um, and this reflects the grace of God. The story that Paul and Barnabas were pushed out for was a story of grace 
which is in itself a story of inclusion, God's grace to all those, including us and all sorts of other people. Everyone, in fact, is welcomed within the grace of God. That is a, a, a movement, a spirit of inclusion, which deserves joy. So to include the excluded uh, is to make this grace more evident in the world. To include the excluded is to show that we don't regard the good news of our faith as something to hoard, but as something that breaks down even our own barriers uh, and something which enables others to be part of, even those who might make us feel uncomfortable at times. It becomes a movement in which um, we can no longer take our own identity for granted, but we must live in a state of risk by being with people alongside people who unsettle us as grace is manifest. So inclusion is so intrinsic to the story that we are part of. Inclusion is so intrinsic to who we are as followers in the way of Jesus, who enjoyed table fellowship with all sorts of people, especially the wrong people. So include and rejoice. I wonder what moments there are in the life of the church or in the world where we might give express joy because of grace becoming manifest. And I use there the word chaos as well, because I think sometimes we we, we like things, to, we like our communities and our church communities to be places of order with neat boundaries. But actually, there's always an element of God doing some chaos amongst us uh, as grace does its work of including even those we regard as the wrong people. Um, so if there was a verb out of chaos, God does chaosing amongst us by being a God of grace, including all sorts of people. So what have been the moments through church history and even now where God's inclusive spirit causes us to rejoice? <clears throat> and the third kind of joy, which I find, is, is in the context of self-reflection, very much connected with the one I've just been talking about, uh, the graciousness, inclusiveness of God. But this one is specifically about how the church is prompted to think about its own sense of calling and purpose and identity. Because if we put grace centre stage, then that affects our sense of who we are. And who we are right now is that the end of the story. We must keep asking ourselves, who are we? In a sense, uh, to be faithful followers of Jesus, someone who kept walking on his way, beckoning people to follow, is to revisit our story again and again. And as we do that, to rejoice. It's not a finished story. To follow Jesus reminds us that we are keep we keep being nudged by the spirit who goes ahead of us, even as she also scoops us up from behind at the same time. Um, we revisit we visit our story again and again. It's not settled. The boundaries aren't fixed. The end of it is still a horizon to which we walk and dance and struggle and crawl. Uh, it's not fleshed out entirely but because it is a horizon where grace is fully manifest there will be change along the way as we are nudged in that direction and the community in acts had to wrestle with this because so for instance they had to work out what they were going to do with non-jewish converts to christianity uh, because they so took for granted that it was mostly or it started out very much as a as a Jewish sect where you took for granted that um, people needed to obey the, the, the Jewish commandments and circumcision being a, a key one about an identity marker. Uh, so what do you do then when you've got other people expressing interest and wanting to join? Do they have to become Jewish before they become Christian? So the early church shows us, and Acts 15 is really 
key to this and, and they kind of resolved it and said actually some of those rules don't need to stand because grace is the crucial thing here um and so they're sort of rediscovering their identity in christ as being a movement not about every regulation and every law of course it's fair to say that even jews themselves wrestle with the exact weights they would give to different laws and different rules and so there's not um consistency or, or a consensus amongst jews themselves but here we see the early christian community deciding that actually um they're going to give greater weight to this sense of the graciousness of god which is barrier defying and that that gives them their central identity and so we follow god in christ who calls us to keep revisiting our story and as we do that to go on our way rejoicing in a sense because love wins um not anything else another way of thinking about this is to say do we have a sense of christians as christians of some things being pure this is pure christianity and other things will taint us well actually perhaps we keep being surprised by the things that seem impure god is in amongst the things that take us by surprise if the kingdom of god is like yeast in the dough yeast was regarded as unclean so the kingdom of God is like something that sometimes is not pure. It sometimes unsettles our assumptions about what our identity is all about. We find God in the cracks, in the inconvenient places, in amongst those who teach us lessons about what it means to follow Jesus. And so we become joyful because we recognize that what we think right now won't, won't, won't be what we think in the year's time how we live as church right now won't be how we are as church in the future we are a staging post along the way to something on the horizon which is more beautiful more just more inclusive more generous spirited more topsy-turvy than anything we currently witness to isn't that something to be joyful about so yeah, just those three dimensions, just as I pick them up again, the, the, the threads of joy, which never is in a vacuum, the about how it's a long protest, joy in the face of structures and systems that hold things in their place, but joy, believing in the promise that those things do not have the last word, that they will turn to dust in themselves. Joy in the face of grace, which is about the inclusion of people who shouldn't be included again and again a movement of inclusion and joy rooted in our willingness and call to be people who interrogate our own sense of who we are to keep asking ourselves what does it mean to be faithful to jesus the jesus who keeps moving towards a horizon where there is more beauty and justice and love than anything we witness to right now so let's be a church of joy Thank you very much, Graham. That was really rich. Uh, I wonder if anyone's got any questions, otherwise I'll make some up. <laughs> yes, Jane. Can I just pick up on the um, the eunuch story? Yes. Um, I don't know whether who's missed the point, you or me or, <laughs> or everybody. Um, he would not have been a eunuch by choice. You're saying about the suspicion that he would have been under and people would have been wary of him. But he will have been created a eunuch by the most horrific sexual abuse. And mm. so he was a survivor. Mm. And the joy for me, yes, he was doing well in his career and probably was there because he was a eunuch. He was a safe person to be around a household with women and so on. But he was getting on fine as a survivor of abuse. But then grasping the joy of, of Christ and, and God will have healed him spiritually he was still a eunuch he was still you know that didn't alter physically but a healed survivor is is a very joyful thing mm. and it wasn't just that he was you know like being gay you know um or he, he wasn't born the way he was 
and he had suffered that at the hands of other people probably as a, as a child and you know he he then takes that step into that that whole different realm of that spiritual healing that joy that comes from that and yet it didn't alter him physically but he was in a whole different place then as a healed as a healed survivor myself i can uh, identify with him and you know see the difference between going on in your ordinary life and taking that step of being fully healed spiritually as well as psychologically yeah no I, I, that's really powerful thank you jane i i completely agree and yes that's there's, I mean, there's so many dimensions and angles to the story of the unit, aren't there? And um, yeah. you know, it's really helpful for bringing out more of the joy, more of the reason for the joy. Yes. Um, and yes, I didn't mean, I suppose, what, what I was saying to, to uh, be contradictory to what you're saying. It's, it's just I was only making one part of it. That kind of, but even though it wasn't something he chose for himself, he still would have been regarded as yeah. un unworthy of being included. Um, but as you say, he wasn't that, his through his inclusion. He wasn't changed. He still was the eunuch. But there's joy in his in in his inclusion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any others? I was just thinking about um, joy in the in the difficult times. And I wonder whether instead of the church in England lamenting the fact that we seem to be in decline, we ought to find joy in beginning a new era or being on a different stage towards the horizon. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, yeah, um, certainly we um, can get caught up in um, the decline narrative. Um, and uh and, and be despairing about it uh, that is something that um institutions yeah in, encourage in us in a certain sense isn't it that um because um we live very much in a world which is always looking for success and looking for measurable outcomes uh, and looking for that, that measures status and worth according to numbers and um bank balance and so on so there are all sorts of things why the church might feel under pressure as, as well as wondering how it's going to continue doing some of the many amazing things it does with fewer people so there are of course legitimate reasons why sadness might well still be a necessary part of that story but only allowing the sadness to define it doesn't seem to be um, very healthy, doesn't seem to be very faithful to the story we're part of. Um, so I, I think it's about holding together um, a, a, an appropriate sadness and weeping um, over the loss of thing, things that are very much loved, while on the other hand, um, recognizing that we are people of cross and resurrection um so even in the midst of death there is the potential always for new life um um the endings aren't only endings um full stops become commas um uh but even without that um we're more likely to accelerate decline <laughs> i would imagine if we only talk about it in negative sense uh, whereas if we uh and I, I don't mean sort of contrive a positivity just in order to feel upbeat but actually if we remember that we are people of audacious grace and people of justice and love that those things can't help but generate some joy in us so that i think it is about this revisiting our story again and again so that it becomes steeped in it to remind ourselves there is cause for joy even where things are hard there is, there are, is cause for joy without being in denial about the, the struggles and, and sadnesses does that make some sense yeah yeah I, I was just struck that joy and hospitality seem to sit together more easily than joy and misery or many of the other things 
Yeah, yeah no, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yes, right. I didn't really pick up on the the household again, did I? But the the the, the family, the household that are baptized, and then they respond both with joy and hospitality is 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 really special, isn't it? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Any other comment? Yeah, Martin. Yeah, uh, just following on from what you were saying, Liz, uh, we note in 2 Corinthians 8 about the joy of the Macedonian Christians that despite this severe ordeal of affliction that they were going through, the persecution from the uh, Romans, they were still able to respond with joy and that joy welled up in a rich generosity in this case clearly contributions to Paul's collection for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, and it's um, it, there can be completely unexpected consequences um, flowing from joy in the face of persecution. I wonder if you have any further thoughts about that? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, well, it, I mean, it's it's great, isn't it, how the com the community, the Christian community, is is noticing that others are struggling, and is wanting to share to even out, you know, where 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 parts of the church have got more resources, they're noticing gaps, and that, so there is a joyfulness in that attentiveness, being attentive to the to the struggles in other parts of the community, not sort of. Um, just giving hoarding resources where there's already strength but actually sharing resources where there is apparent weakness um yeah i'm sure that has lessons for us today and how resources are distributed in the church as well but um yeah um persecution enjoys a really tricky one isn't it um to say Barnabas and Paul did manage it, but they they walked out of it. Um, but I wouldn't want to tell anyone who's actually undergoing real persecution who should be joyful, because what right would I have to do that? Um, but it is I'm still struck by the fact that some people undergoing it remain joyful, and I kind of think I don't know if I would, but um, yeah, sometimes. There's a joy. Um, the, sometimes persecution can make you feel you're doing the right thing. <laughs> if, if it's worth fighting for, isn't it? it can make, uh, and so sometimes there's a, a joy in the confidence that comes from persecution. Um, but it remains a, a difficult thing for other people to talk about if they're not experiencing it. I don't know if that answers your question. Any any other comments or questions? Yeah, can I uh, say thank you, Graham? That was uh, uh, very thought provoking as ever. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's just interesting reflection, I think, on the way in which uh, you can't pin things down. And um, in a sense, your exploration of holy anarchy and your explanation of it today um, it, it is to be wary of kind of putting boundaries and pinning things down and saying this is exactly it. And, uh, you know, f following Martin's uh, comment, which um, you know, is is very very um, again uh, following uh, follows on uh, about the Roman persecution and in the face of that um, the joy coming uh, in Acts. Um, yes, there is a topsy turviness as the world is turned upside down, but the first non-Jew to be named. Um, who then discovers joy with his household is a serving centurion called Cornelius. And, um, and one of the other centurions at the end of the story, is it Julius, is described as a kindly centurion. And so um, there aren't clear cut uh, definitions and defined boundaries, even inside the account, 
of the first uh, followers of Jesus. And I always think it's it's kind of quite quite perceptive, really, that Luke, Luke describes those followers as people of the way, um, mm. as if that's uh, always we're always journeying, and, and there's always something more to discover, and you can't just pin things down. Always more questions to ask. Mm. Yeah, oh, thanks, Richard. Yeah, really helpful reflection. Um, yeah, I mean, it is amazing, isn't it? I say centurions. I mean, the the church really shouldn't work, um, and 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 sometimes it really doesn't. <laughs> but uh, but it's supposed to be this community of people who have no right to fit together. Um, yeah, centurions and um, yeah, through through all, all the different mix of people who are who are re responding to it and um and I, I was coming back to the um the question of growth and so i suppose that uh, some, sometimes churches um are said to be more likely to grow if they're just consist of people who are like each other um but in which case that's a not a great church <laughs> it should be hard to grow because we seek to be communities of people who are very unlike each other um, um and, and what a great model that would be for the world too wouldn't it um if we try to be so ridiculously diverse as an expression of the grace of god that it becomes inefficient and awkward to be community but what a cause of joy Well, that brings us up to time. Thanks very much, Graham. That was really thought provoking and valuable. And uh, thank you to you and to everybody else. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. I'll pay you thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you. That's a wonderful final one for us to have. And thank you to all of you. We will send out details of the autumn series. We are planning October the 11th. Um, Jen won't be here because she has Pilgrim Week that week, but I hope to be here. And we'll send out details of who's speaking, what the events are. Meanwhile, have a good summer, everybody. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>